Hello and welcome everyone to Nemo's webinar, Creative Europe, what's in it for museums? In our first webinar in Corona times, we are happy that we can offer you this digital format to get some input in your home office. My name is Mira Höschler and I work at uh, the Nemo office, the network of European museum organizations that represents European museums towards policymakers on both national and EU level. NEMO trains museum professionals in Europe through our training courses, learning exchanges and the webinars. The network also provides the platform to challenge and to create EU corporations between its members. So we are lucky to have uh, here today Anja Dietzmann and Lia Stöver um, for today's webinar. They both work for the Creative Europe Desk Culture, which is the national contact point for Creative Europe culture in Germany. Those offices can be found in 41 countries and you should check out if you have one in your country as well, because people will help you with the funding opportunities and the application process. Today we will learn more about funding opportunities for museums through the Creative Europe program. On NEMO's website you can find more information about different uh, funding opportunities and we will provide you later with the link. In order to understand better the needs of the museum sector, NEMO has published in 2019 a report on the museum's participation in the centralized EU funding programs from 2014 to 18. And this report made clear that museums in comparison to other cultural sectors do not really take full advantage of the existing funding opportunities, which we like to change. And this is also why we have this webinar session today. You can find the report and the recommendations in, uh, on NEMO's website as well. We have two um, question rounds in the middle and at the end of the webinar. And you will have the opportunity to ask questions in the chat function. And I now hand over to Anja and Lea and I wish you all a fruitful session. All right, uh, thank you Mira. So I switched on my mic and I hope everyone can hear me now. Um, so yeah, hi and good morning. Uh, my name is Lea Stöver and together with my colleague Anja, I will um, guide you through the, today's webinar. Um, so I will start and then later on Anja joins us. Um, so we are both working for the Creative Europe Desk Kultur in Germany. Uh, we are based in Bonn and now the two of us, as I guess most of you are uh, in home office, so that's why we coming in here from different computers. Um, yeah, I think um, actually doing this webinar was the best idea we had in 2019 when we planned this year because that's the only event we can hold right now and I think you all are experiencing um, the other thing. So thank you to Nemo, thank you to Mira uh, and the whole team for organizing this and um, yeah, I will start with the, um, the today's agenda. So what are we planning to do with you? Um, so first of all, I will give a short introduction to uh, what is Creative Europe, what is the program about. And then Anja will join us and she will um, focus more on the question what's in it for museums and also present you specific data on museums and EU funding or funding through Creative Europe. And then chapter three is actually the, the biggest part of the webinar because we want to um, guide you through the European Cooperation Project Scheme. This is the biggest scheme uh, within the program Creative Europe and we want you to understand what can you apply for, uh, how does it work, um, what other projects already have been funded in the museum sector. And um, yeah, then in the end, and uh, we do a, sh uh, a short who is who, um, so can you can contact, um, uh, how can you uh, get in touch with maybe the Creative Europe desk in your country, because we know that not all of you, or I guess most of you are not coming from Germany, but also from other EU countries or other European countries. So uh, we will explain you how um, you find your Creative Europe desk in your country. All right, um, so I continue now with the question, um, what is Creative Europe? Um, and I go to this slide. So to sum it up, Creative Europe is this. <laughs> so that uh, the, uh, all the pictures you see are coming from different funded projects. And as you see, um, it is um, it shows projects from many cultural sectors. So we have 
a lot of um, performing arts, arts, theater, music, uh, but also visual arts. You see, we have some pictures from museums. Um, so Creative Europe is, um, to, to say it with a, a very formally language, is the European Commission's framework program for support to the cultural, creative and audiovisual sectors. So this means um, Creative Europe is a program which funds projects from all these sectors. And this means um, it includes museums, um, galleries, archives. So I hope all the sectors you are coming from. To explain it a bit more in detail, you can see here um, uh, how much money there is for Creative Europe and uh, also the, du the, the, the duration of the program. So Creative Europe runs from 2014 to 2020. Um, and we have a budget now of uh, 1.46 billion euro. And maybe you're wondering now, so, okay, why does it end 2020? And why are they doing then a seminar or a webinar on Creative Europe uh, right now at the end of the program? So um, good news first, um, the program will continue also after 2020 and all e EU programs. So all the others, which you also might know, maybe Erasmus or Horizon 2020 or any other program, they all run for seven years until 2020. And then there starts a new, um, a new circle or new cycle of programs. And uh, then in 2021, uh, we start with a new Creative Year program. Um, and we already know about the new program that there might be or there will be some changes. But most important is that the um, scheme for cooperation projects is continu continuing. So. Um, most of the information we are giving you today will be also valid from 2021 on and we also explain you or say, okay, there might be slight changes. So um, if you're really interesting, interested in applying, uh, you should check our websites or um, the website from your desk. Okay, so much about the time and now let's uh, have a look at the both sub-programs. Um, you can see here the media sub-program, uh, which has uh, uh, 56 um, percent of the budget. The media sub-program is dedicated to the audiovisual sector in um, Europe. So it means um, projects from the audiovisual sector, um, so films, series, but also gaming. They are funded through this media sub-program, which you see here on, on your left side. And then in the middle, we have the culture sub-program. Um, it's a bit smaller, um, but it's uh, it's covering the rest of the cultural sector. So everything which is not film or gaming or series or documentaries goes into the cultural sub program. So everything from uh, cultural, from audiovisual arts, from uh, performing arts, music, um, circus art, museums, galleries, everything which is not audiovisual is funded by the cultural sub program, and that's. Um, um, what we are talking about uh, today. And Anya and me, we are both experts for the cultural sub-program. So, so that's what we, we know a little bit about. <laughs> and then the cross-sector is, um, uh, I, I won't uh, talk about it uh, that much today. There are some specific calls, but also some money for, of course, um, um, the desks and the administration. So um, maybe you now have the question, OK, why actually does the European Union support the creative and cultural sectors in, Euro in Europe? But also, um, why are they doing it or what, what do they actually want to achieve with this program? And this brings me to uh, my next slide. Um, and here um, uh, we summarize very generally the vision of the EU cultural policy and can say that the European Union has actually two visions. Um, so you see the first one, um, which is to safeguard, develop and promote European cultural and linguistic diversity and to promote Europe's cultural heritage. So that's, let's say, the first and foremost vision of the European Union in the field of culture. Um, I normally summarize this vision as uh, under the, the, the heading of headline of unitary, unity through diversity meaning that, of course, the European Union does not want to, um, uh, to unify all the different cultures we have in Europe 
uh, in the EU, but also beyond the EU. But of course, they want to support the diversity of these cultures, of the national cultures, of the regional cultures. But also they want to make um, us, aware, us aware that, of course, there is something which um, uh, which connects us in Europe and um, and especially they want to promote the, the safeguarding of the cultural heritage in Europe. And then the second vision, uh, which you can see here, is to, strength, to strengthen the competitiveness of the European cultural and creative sectors. So this comes in as the second uh, vision of the EU cultural policy. And this means that, of course, this is also um, important to the EU to support the cultural and creative industries and to also make them competitive. Um, within Europe, but also beyond. Uh, um, and this is one of, or this is the second vision of the EU cultural policy. Okay, so this was, uh, let's say, a very general introduction to uh, what the EU uh, thinks about cultural policy, what they want to focus on. And um, I'm now getting a little bit more into detail. And I want to um, just um, shortly speak about the, um, about the, here it comes, the European Agenda for Culture. And um, this is a very, for us and also then for you, uh, a very important document which was published by the European Commission in uh, May 2018. So already or almost two years ago. And um, um, it gives a bit more of, uh, of a detail of how the European Commission sees a culture and how they understand and how also eventually they think about funding for culture. Sure. Um, so you could wonder now why why are they why should we look at it or why are we talking about it? And I want to keep it easy and say you want the money, so you should better look at how they want to spend the money. And by they, I mean of course the European Union and the European Commission, which is um, responsible for the program. So if you want to apply for money, you of course should get a bit of a feeling of um, how do they think of culture, how do they see it how, where do they put emphasis on, uh, where lies the focus? Um, and that's why I'm presenting this to you. And it's actually not so, so difficult to understand. You see that we have five um, uh, dimensions here or five focus points. Um, first of all, the so social dimension of culture. So the European Commission says that culture definitely has a social dimension and that culture can harness um, or that they want to harness the power of culture and cultural diversity and that they see that culture can bring social cohesion and well-being to the citizen of Europe. So that's, let's say, one perspective on culture they have. The second one comes more from an economic point of view and this relates also to, uh, you remember, the second vision I just presented to you and they say that um, supports culture also supports, of course, the creativity of people and that they especially want to support the creative industries in Europe and um, that these industries bring jobs and growth for people in Europe. Then we come to the third um, dimension, the external dimension. And here the Commission says that they think culture has um, the power to strengthen international and cultural relations. So, um, and what they definitely want to see is that um, through cultural pro projects, uh, not only uh, the EU countries, but also um, uh, countries beyond the European Union um, work together and strengthen their relations um, through culture. And then the fourth point, digital for, cul digital for culture. This is one important, uh, yeah, let's say topic or point which, which the EU really um, wants to emphasize. Um, they, um, in their agenda for culture, they say very clearly that they want to support the creative and cultural sectors to support, to, to um, strengthen the digital skills and also the use of digital um, means and media. So that's something the EU is, is really highlighting. And then the uh, fifth point, protecting and valorizing cultural heritage. This is also something very important for the European Commission. And I hope that some of you um, remember the European Year of Cultural Heritage, which we had in 2018, yes, 18 it was. 
Um, so this is also something which is very important for the European Commission is the cultural heritage, heritage of Europe. That's something they want to support, um, they want to safeguard it. And I hope that maybe some of you coming from the museum sector or galleries or archives are especially um, uh, worrying and taking care of the cultural heritage in Europe. So that's something where you could maybe see a connection between your work and um, the, the, the vision the European Union has of culture. Okay, so this was my little introduction to the um, to the basics of EU cultural policy. And now I already talked a lot and um, I also, and not only I, but also Anja and, um, and Nemo, uh, we want to learn a bit more about you. So we prepared um, actually two questions. And um, I'm now switching to the, um, to the questions and I would like to ask you to give us an answer. Um, Let's see, give me a moment. Okay, there it comes. So you should now see um, two questions. Um, the question is what type, the first question, what type of organization do you represent? The second is, do you have experience with European funding? Uh, I can see already you're starting to answer. I would say I give you another 60 seconds. Um, to answer the question and then we can see the results. Just a little remark for you. Um, you can click at the um, presentation slide um, you see on your desktop now. So you don't have to use the chat function. Ah, okay, thank you, Anja. Yeah. Okay, so we have 25 seconds more. I hope all of you can access uh, the questions. Okay, I guess you heard the alarm from my <laughs> from my mobile phone. Uh, I will now finish um, the poll and I share the results with you. Can you see the results? So, Anya, do you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, I, yeah. perfect. So, I guess uh, uh, the other participants can also uh, see it. So let's have a look at it. So, um, okay, what type of organization do you represent? Um, yeah, that's actually what we expected. Um, um, most of you are coming from museums, uh, one gallery, one archive, uh, also a couple of people from the public administration, students, okay, no artists and uh, other. Okay, um, so maybe if you want, you can also specify the other uh, in the set chat function so we can maybe see uh, who the others are. Um, um, so we ask for this, um, sorry, um, that was my alarm again. Um, so why we ask for this is because one of the important uh, formal criteria for um, Creative Europe is that um, natural persons cannot apply but you need to be a legal person. So for example a museum or an archive or also a public um, authority. So that is something which Anya also will explain um, uh, later on. Um, and then let's have a look at the second question. Do you have experiences with European funding? Okay, so we see already 12 people having people having experience with uh, Creative Europe. That is great. So I still hope I can tell you a bit uh, uh, some news today. Um, and then we see also Horizon and Erasmus. We specifically ask for this because as Mira already said in the beginning, Nemo did uh, um, research on um, how museums use European funding and looked into these three programs. 
Um, so um, it's interesting to see that some of you have experience and that even more people know Erasmus Plus than Creative Europe. That's actually interesting for us. So um, I see uh, that it's all really worth doing it. And I think the 43 people who have no experience will learn a lot about European funding today. Okay, and that's now the moment where I hand over to Anja um, and she will continue um, with the question, what's in it for museums? Okay. Um, a warm welcome also from me. Um, hello, everyone. I will go on with the next question on um, what is in it for museum, like Leah already introduced. So um, we said that um, the Creative Europe Culture Funding Program is um, open for every cultural sector, but um, especially museums can benefit from um, yes, from the program. So we looked at uh, the EU um, funding report by NEMO and um, found some numbers about how museums are using and um, are using the um, the funding. So um, you can see here. Um, you can see here the funded projects um, in uh, in the all the funded projects from 2014 to 2018 in the funding schemes: small cooperation projects, large cooperation projects, European networks, and European platforms. And you can also see um, what share museums, galleries, and archives have in this and these special um, schemes. So it is always around 20%. We, I, I didn't list it all funding schemes here because I just wanted to give you an overview. So there are some more special calls um, that I didn't list, um, didn't list here. But uh, looking at the funded projects from 2014 to 2018 in total, um, 104 projects led by museums um, were funded. So, so there is a, a bit potential for more, but um, you see that um, museums, galleries and archives are um, an important uh, sector um, that, is, that is funded in the program. And we were always talking about European cooperation and um, what and about transnational cooperation. So lots of different countries um, are involved in these projects and um, the 104 projects are led by museums from all over Europe. Um, this is this slide shows you the geographical coverage um, of the funding um, of your um, for European culture projects. Um, there are some museum hubs like you see in UK, Germany, in Italy and also in Slovenia. But um, there are lots of, there are many more um, countries involved in the projects. Um, these are only the organizations um, that are the leading um, partners of the projects, of the European cooperation projects especially. Um, and here you can see um, all the partner organizations. So it is even um, more transnational um, than you, you saw before. So this is the picture um, we have when we look at the support that Creative Europe Culture gives to, um, European, to the European museum sector. And um, to answer the, the post question before, um, the museum sector is a field that can benefit from the Creative Europe program and especially from the funding scheme for European cooperation projects. So we, um, we will um, look a bit closer to the European cooperation projects now. And I will start with um, one funded project, uh, the Smart 
Places project, a European audience development project. Um, it is a cooperation project that runs from 2016 to 2020, and it involves um, eight. It involves um, eight partners, eight organizations, six museums, uh, one university, and one IT company. And uh, the museums that uh, put that project together. Um, they all experienced uh, the loss of their own community and their own audience and the difficulties to, to deepen the connection to their audience. So they, they started this um, audience development project um, to get to know their local audiences, to engage them um, and to find new methods and formats to strengthen the ties um, of their audience. They were organizing, organizing micro projects involving two to three partners, um, always exchanging their experiences during conferences um, or during their partner meetings. Um, this is one, one short example to give you a, a glimpse what a European cooperation project is about. We, we will have some more examples for you. Um, so that you get a better um, better picture of um, this funding scheme. So, what is a European cooperation project? Um, we want to dive deeper into this um, this funding scheme because it is the biggest funding scheme of the subprogram culture. Um, Seventy percent uh, goes to 70% of the whole Creative Europe culture budget um, goes to the European cooperation projects. And we have here an, an overview of all of the formal criteria. I will, will start um, to introduce the formal criteria of uh, this funding scheme to you. So the European cooperation projects are divided in two categories. Um, one category um, are the small scale cooperation projects and the other one the large scale cooperation project. So for the small scale um, cooperation projects, um, a minimum of three organizations from three different countries um, have to work together and have to organize um, and design the project. Um, the maximum duration is four years. And the EU funds 60% of the eligible costs or a maximum amount of 200,000 euro. Um, for the large scale um, cooperation projects, um, it is all, all things are a bit bigger. So um, at least six organizations from six different countries um, have, to be, um, have to organize the project. They have to work together. And for a duration of maximum four years, that's the same. Um, the EU grant is about 50% of eligible cost or a maximum amount of 2 million euros. So these are um, the formal, formal uh, some formal information, some formal criteria um, you need if you're interested in these, um, in, in these categories. And it's always, the structure is always that um, you have one lead partner, um, which is uh, responsible for the administration of the project, but um, you will submit one joint application with all partners. So it has to be a co really a cooperation project where you um, all work together and where you design the project together. So which organizations are eligible? Um, we already talked about um, the different sectors. So the funding program is open for every cultural sector and um, no natural persons are eligible. So um, you, have to, you have to be a legal entity. Organizations must um, have a legal entity, they can be public or private, um, they can be in the non-profit or in the profit-oriented sector, um, that doesn't matter, um, every organization 
in this field is eligible. And uh, one important thing for the lead partner is that the lead partner has to be um, legally established for two years prior to the deadline. Um, what is also funded um, are projects with different um, with organizations from different sectors. So not only museums that are working together, but um, perhaps like in the project I already presented, museums working together with universities or working together with uh, multimedia art. So um, there are many projects um, involving organizations from different sectors. Um, the next point are, is about um, eligible countries. So um, not only the now 70, um, the now 27 EU member states um, are eligible, but there are also some more countries that participate in the program. So um, it, the question will probably arise. Um, so I will start with UK. Um, UK will, at the moment, um, it looks like UK will not participate in the program uh, ne for next year, so in the next um, program period. Um, that means that UK organizations cannot be official partners, but uh, they can also participate in the projects as third countries. Um, it's the same with Switzerland, Switzerland um, and Swiss organizations. Uh, they can also just be third countries because Switzerland is not participating in the Creative Europe Culture Program. But we have some, some more participating countries um, like Iceland and Norway and also um, countries from the Eastern or Southern Partnership of Europe. Mm, especially Tunisia um, is, what, is the only North African country that um, partic is participating in the program. So I, um, these are all the formal criteria um, you need to know for this funding scheme. And um, we have now a question slot uh, for you. So if you have any questions so far, please use the chat function and um, we um, hopefully can answer most of them. So I, I will just give you some time to, to post your questions. Yeah, I think I see there are a couple of questions on the third country question. Um, so maybe Anya, we can start mm -hmm. with this one. Uh, yes, uh, so the question is, can you tell me more details about third country organizations? Um, third country organization means that the organization is not an official partner, but um, there can be activities in the third country um, that are funded by another official partner. So it's like in, in German, we have this um, phrase to say, take someone hookapack. So you, you, you take uh, this organization with you. An official partner takes the organization of a third country um, with them. Um, there are some, some restriction to that. I think about... 30% of the eligible costs can go to third countries and not more. So. Yeah, and I think then there was a question, how would it work, for example, for Russia or, or then also for UK? And um, yeah, that, that's the case. So if you are a museum from, from Russia or then from UK from next year on, you can come in as a third um third country partner 
which works as Anya just explained. Okay, then I see there a question, what does it mean to be a legally established person um, two years before deadline? Um, so this means, for example, uh, so you are a legal person, let's say you are a company um, and you were, you, you founded your companies um, last year, um, let's say April 2019. So um, when you want to apply for a cooperation project and you want to be the coordinator, you can only do this uh, then from April 2021 on, because then you are legally established for two years. Um, but this only um, is a restriction for the coordinator. Um, for the partner, it's different. Then you can also be just legally established for one year or two months. Uh, it doesn't matter. And of course, it does not only go for companies, but also for associations. So for any kind of, of legal person. So the next question, question number five, does the applications must come from three different countries? So, so um, like I said, you always have one application, but um, this application is for a project that involves three, at least three organizations from three different countries. So um, yes, in this case, um, three different countries have to be involved into the, in the project if you want to do a small cooperation project. Okay, then uh, I think I will go with the next question. And it, uh, someone was saying that um, I personally experienced that it's a big challenge to request the guarantee letters from the organizations to get the funds already granted. Do you have any updates regarding um, this condition? So um, I hope I can answer to that question. Um, from what I understand is that um, when you apply for the funding and you, you only apply for co-financing from the EU, of course, you need some national money or some other man money to come in. When you apply for the EU grant, you don't need um, um, the, um, the guarantee that you already have other funds. So let's say you are applying um, this year, winter this year, um, and you think about applying also for some more money uh, um, within a national um, organization, a national association, then um, you can apply for EU money and then you can later also apply for the national money. And then at the moment where you receive um, the letter um, that you get the EU grant, you also need to show that you have national or that you have the co-financing, be it national money or regional money or whatever. So you only need uh, to, to, to make, to verify that you have this home financing at the moment where you want to start the project. So I hope um, um, that answers the question. Um, yeah, maybe we can say we have time for two more questions and then we sh I think we should go on. So you maybe you want to pick question seven, Anya? Yes, um, how long will it take before um, the answer of the application arrive. So um, you have a deadline and uh, the evaluation of um, all the applications um, last at least three months, around three months. And um, normally the deadline is in the end of the year, then you will get a notification letter um, in the end of spring, um, starting of summer, and you can start with your project um, in September. So this is the timeline, but um, we will show you the timeline later on um, too. Okay, then I go for uh, the last question at the moment, which was how to find your partners across Europe, any tips or suggestions? Um, yes, we have. Um, I think I would start with two tips. The first is um, uh, go and find your European network um, for your sector. It can be NEMO for museums. Um, I know that NEMO normally organizes 
organizes, I think, one conference per year or even two. Um, so this might be a good um, occasion to meet other people who want to work on the European level who are interested. Of course, there's not only NEMO, there are more networks also, and Anya will present them in the end. And you can also find out maybe there are European networks or national networks. So it's always good to, to go and see people, maybe not at the moment, but hopefully next year, um, and to, to get in touch with them. So I know of projects um, who did it like this. And the other option is um, you can write to your National Creative Europe desk. And you can um, uh, fill out a, a partner search sheet saying, okay, I'm this and that organization. I want to do this and that project. Can you, can you please spread the news uh, about this idea uh, within your network? And um, the 41 desks or 40 desks then spread these sheets um, into their countries. And um, then you will get answers from interested organizations from all over Europe. So that's two options you have uh, when you look for partners. Okay, because we have some more um, slides and some more content we want to present, I will now go on with the next slide. And I will just um, um, talk shortly about one, uh, uh, one other museum project, which we wanted to present to you. It's called Switch, um, Sharing a World of Inclusion, Creativity and Heritage. Um, it's a project uh, which already uh, finished and it was uh, made up by 10 partners, mostly museums of ethnography and world culture. And um, the project had one starting idea or one starting point. Um, it asks or it's actually the partners saw that um, there is not the one European identity, but that European identities are diverse and rapidly changing and um, that uh, they at these uh, museums of ethnography want to become part of the dis discussion um, about European uh, identities and in the 21st century. So uh, here you can see uh, the different partners. Um, like Anja explained, you, you always need to have one lead partner. Um, in this case, it was the Weltmuseum Wien, which is the Museum for World Cultures in Vienna. And Austria, and then you have nine other uh, museums. Um, in Germany, we had the museum from Stuttgart, the Linden Museum, but also from uh, many other countries. So you see, the program, um, sorry, the project ran for four years, and um, they had uh, lots of different activities, which were, for example, conferences, but also cooperative exhibition forms, meaning that they. Um, um, uh, that they planned and then also implemented exhibitions together and, and then they could show them at different places uh, in Europe. And um, they also, of course, created a sort of documentation of the project. And what is interesting about this project, and that's also why I, 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 or we decided to, to show it to you, is that um, the Switch project was already, I think, the second or third project by these um, uh, different organizations, the different museums. And they also started a new project uh, just last year. And the new project is called Taking Care. And this time um, it's also um, a project of museums of ethnography and co uh, world culture museums. But this time they want to look at the connection be between ethnographic collections and the climate crisis. So you can see here um, they uh, did this project for three, four years uh, on a specific uh, topic, but then they worked on it for four years and they decided to go on and look now um, to another topic. So that's something you can do. And from what I know is that also um, the partners changed, not all of them, but not all partners which are part or were part of Switch project are now again part of um, the Taking Care project, which is the new project, but it changed. And new music museums came in and others left because maybe they were not interested or they didn't have the capacities for the next four years. Okay, um, I will now go on with a bit more um, uh, the question on um, not the formal criteria of uh, creative of cooperation projects, but uh, on the question of the characteristics. So what is funded and um, here on this slide, you actually see, let's say, five buzzwords. So, thing five words um, 
um, you should definitely re remember when uh, we ask you uh, in one week or one month uh, about cooperation projects and we have a, a chat on it. So most important is the European added value. Your co cooperation project, your European cooperation project needs a European added value. That's really the most important thing for your cooperation project. And European added value means that you have a good answer to the question, why do you need European partners? So it's very important to show that your project really needs the cooperation um, between European partners, that you need the, the insight, the knowledge, the experience from other European museums or galleries, archives, libraries, what, whatsoever. Um, and you need to, to show why this shouldn't be a project only on the national or regional level. So somehow you need to show to the, to the Commission and to the EU um, and to be convincing uh, why uh, this should be a project on the European level. And then the other characteristics, um, yeah, I would say naturally follow. You need transport activities, meaning that you shouldn't only organize activities in one country, but uh, the activities should take place in the different countries. Um, you should really cooperate, meaning um, you should work together on the problems and challenges and the topic you choose. And it's not just one organization doing everything and thinking uh, and um, finding solution, but, but it's really cooperating. And then finally, your project should have a broad, broader effect and it should be sustainable and also transferable. This means, I think, yeah, it's a bit of buzzwords here, but um, let's make it a bit easier. You should think about how um, can you make an effect not only on the people or the institutions which are directly part of the project, but also beyond that. So how, you, how can you maybe um, uh, prepare some documentation or some website which really shows to the people what you were doing in the project and how can they also make use of it? That can be a, a, a website, for example. Okay, and this brings me now to the next one, um, which is the priorities. And so we are getting now a bit deeper into this uh, whole topic of cooperation projects. Um, because when you decide to do a cooperation project, a European cooperation project, uh, within Creative Europe, you need to choose between different priorities and you have to say, okay, I'm doing this priority and now I explain you how I want to do the uh, uh, priority. Um, and so that's what you need to say. And you really need to focus on one or two or three of these priorities. So the first, um, I think is very natural transnational mobility, meaning the mobility of not only artists, uh, but also of uh, art uh, in Europe. The second one, audience development, means um, uh, a project which is actively engaging with new audience, different audiences. Um, and Anja already described the Smart Places project. That was definitely a project very much thinking about audience development. Then the third is digitization, meaning you are using digital or new digital means for new um, uh, uh, kinds of working together, new forms of expressions. So really using digital means for innovative um, project ideas. New business models, uh, the fourth uh, priority means, um, could mean creating new skills for business related activities. Um, so you might think about how can we not only uh, um, present what we do, but how can we only uh, also think about making this a business model and a business idea. And then the last one is training and education. Um, this would mean a project which is um, also focused on the idea of um, uh, training, for example, staff members, um, but also um, audience and all the people uh, who, uh, with whom you are engaged in your institution. Okay, and um, this actually brings me to another uh, project example. Um, it's uh, quite a new project. It's called Beyond Matter, Cultural Heritage on the Verge of Virtual Reality. Uh, this project only started last year, October, and um, a German museum, the 
Center for, uh, uh, for Art and Media in Karlsruhe is the lead partner here. And you see that they have um, a couple of more museums um, as partners, but they also have, um, for example, one um, Czech company um, as partner. And this is very important for this project because this project wants to revive um, art and cultural content through VR. So what they want to do is um, look at exhibitions and artworks which already um, are in the archives of museums, which already happened, and they want to revive them through virtual reality. So this means they are using new and innovative means of digital um, uh, technology, and they are also addressing this idea of audience development because they want to bring bring the cultural content to new audiences, to audiences which were maybe not yet alive when these exhibitions took place or which did not have the chance to see it uh, because they, they just simply live in a different country. So here you can see how a project can address different uh, priorities. One interesting, interesting thing is maybe for some of you that the project Beyond Meta, they have an open call right now and they are looking for uh, practitioners and also theoreticians who work on the question of um, uh, how to bring art content um, via virtual reality to new audiences. So if maybe some of you uh, is working on that topic, I definitely recommend uh, to um, have a look at the webpage beyondmeta.eu. Um, because the call is open and they look for residencies in Tallinn, Tirana and Karlsruhe. So yeah, have a look at it. All right, and now I'm almost at the end of uh, um, our chapter three and I will just briefly have a look at one important question and that's the money. Of course, uh, you can talk a lot about content and partners and everything, but in the end, you also have to care about the costs. And this is just a short summary of uh, the questions which costs are eligible. Um, so you see four main categories of, um, of costs, which are project activities. So everything which is related to the project, um, to costs which um, which arise uh, uh, by implementing the project. Then, of course, communication. So everything you need um, uh, in order to communicate and disseminate your project. Then, of course, travel costs. Again, maybe not at the moment, but normally that's a big um, cost heading um, because you need to travel around Europe to make the project run. And then also the personal costs. That's usually the biggest um, subheading. So all these different four, four different cost categories make up your um, total budget. And from this, you can have 7% of indirect costs. Um, and with this indirect costs, you can, um, um, this money you can spend on, for example, rent or insurance or everything you also need to pay. Okay, and this brings me also shortly to the question, how can you co-finance such a project? And this, of course, is also very different in the 41 countries. So it's always good to talk with your creative your desk about this question. So um, you could pay your pro project from your own resources if you have. You, you can, of course, apply for other part uh, for other funding from private or public sources. And you can you could second your paid personal. So you can say, OK, we already have persons working in our institution. They are paid through our normal funding. And now we say they work for, let's say, two years on this project and we pay them. So that's then the income you have. It's not allowed to have other EU funding. So you cannot apply for Creative Europe and Erasmus at the same time. And in-kind contribution also do not work. Good. Um, then the very last question is about the timeline. Um, if you decide now to apply for a cooperation project, um, you definitely sh have look, uh, should have a look at the Creative Europe Desk's website throughout the whole year, because this timeline could change. Normally, we have a call for cooperation projects in the winter time, but I'm actually expecting this call more in the spring of 2021, because right now we are, you know, in a crisis all over Europe. 
So I think the timeline may change. And normally you then have a maximum eight weeks um, uh, until the deadline is. And then the results come uh, six months later. So you normally apply and then you have to wait another eight months until you have the news and the results. Um, and then um, it takes some more weeks um, until you can start a project. Good. And the very last question is now, because I already talked about it, um, who is, uh, how is it going after 2020? Um, because we spoke about the new uh, program. It starts in 2021. And um, I want to keep it short here because time is a bit running. Um, the most important thing for you to know is that the cooperation project scheme is uh, continuing. So everything we told you today about the formal and informal criteria and also the ones uh, which are um, content related, um, this is this scheme will continue. We expect slight changes, so it's always good to have a look at um, the public publications of your Creative Europe desks. But if you are planning a cooperation project with different partners, let's say three different partners from three different countries, this idea will continue also beyond 2021. And that's also the good news. We have some new schemes, especially one which is dedicated to the music sector. And also the topic of cultural heritage, heritage should be supported um, after 2020. Okay, and that's where now my colleague Anja will do a short who is who so that you also know who to contact, contact after um, the today's webinar. Yes, so um, we are almost finished. Um, at the end, I want to give you an overview um, where you can get help for the application process and who is who in the um, on the European level, um, who is developing the program and um, who is doing the administration. So here at this slide, you can see um, at the one hand on the um, left side, uh, the European Commission, the DJ EAC, um, Director General for Education, Youth, uh, Sport and Culture. This is the, um, yes, the Director General that is responsible for the content related um, questions of the program. So they're defining strategies and evaluating the program. Um, on the right side, you see the executive agency. Um, they are implementing the program. So um, they are there for um, the administration of um, everything. And um, when you get funding, you also have a project officer um, coming from the agency. Um, we, the Creative Europe Desks Culture, um, are at the interface between the EU level and the national level. So um, we get the information um, from the EU level and we will transfer it to our um, cultural and creative sectors um, in the 41 countries that are participating in the program. And um, we are just one desk. Um, of the 41 that are all over Europe and you can you can find your local desks um, at our web at our web page um, you just you can find the link um, here um, on the slide so um, and look it up there they will help you um, with the application they will um, guide you um, through um, yes, through the whole process and consult um, about the project you are planning. Um, on our map, you can see um, where all the desks are located. Um, beside um, the Creative Europe desks that um, can give you the one hand information on the program, um, the European networks, like Lea already mentioned, are very helpful and very useful um, if you are interested in European cooperation. So um, we have NEMO, um, the network of European Muse Museum Organization, um, that can help you with uh, finding partners and um, that also provides with information. 
Um, then there are some more um, museum related networks like the European Route of Industrial Heritage, um, Europa Nostra. Europa Nostra is um, specialized on cultural heritage. And we also have the Association of European Open Air Museums. Um, all these networks, they gather information and experiences um, from their sectors and they also um, try to um, give the sectors interest to a European level. So, um, yes, they are very helpful, um, helpful too. So, um, we hope we um, could give you an idea of um, what uh, Creative Europe culture is about, what the European cooperation projects are about, and we are very, we are very happy that um, so many people listen to um, our webinar. Um, and we also know that, um, especially in these challenging times, um, it is good to know where, where you can get funding. So if you have any further questions um, on the program, you can post them in the chat function. I know it's already 12 o'clock, but if you have some more time, we, um, yes, we will stay for, for a bit and um, <laughs> for around yeah. five, five minutes. And yes, you can post some more questions here. Okay, I already had a look at the questions while Anya was still presenting. So uh, I think I will just start answering two questions. Um, one question was if partners can come from countries outside the EU, for example, South America. Yes, this is uh, theoretically possible, but still you should always remember that this is funding for EU and the, in Europe. So it should be still a project focusing on the European cultural sector. If you think that a partner from South America can bring something into the project, what you don't have in Europe or what is really enriching, this is something you can do. But um, it shouldn't be a project which is then more focused on South America than on Europe. That's um, the answer to that question. And then uh, another question, question number 12 is um, can an institution that exists for le less than two years be a partner in a Creative Europe project? Yes, uh, the rule with the two years of existence only applies to coordinators. So if you, you are only a partner, um, you can exist for one year, two months, one year and three months whatsoever. Good. I'm just looking at the questions. Um, there's one question, number 16. Um, what if one partner quit because of impossibility of keeping on it? Um, we always suggest that um, you don't only have three organizations from three different countries, but you always have one extra. So um, a lot of projects, um, small corporation projects, for example, are working with four organizations from four different countries. So if someone, if for some organization it's not possible to um, get on, you can still um, do the project. That's um, quite important. Yes. Okay, uh, we can see that there are really a lot of questions and I'm afraid that we cannot answer all of them, um, but don't be afraid and there is someone in your country who can answer it or you can also get in touch uh, with us. That's why I go back to the slide where you find the um, link to um, how to find your local desks. So we definitely advise you to get in touch with the desk in your country. I mean, you, of course, can all also write to, to uh, us at the German desk. Um, we are also happy to help everyone from Europe, but maybe it might even be more convenient for you to write in your mother tongue. And um, yeah, I would say I suggest that we can maybe answer um, uh, two more questions. Um, there was one on the impact of the cu uh, current COVID situation on the agenda. Um, I have to say that I don't know if there will be a, a direct impact. 
um, because the program, um, uh, which then starts next year, was already discussed um, by the three EU institutions, the Parliament, the Commission and the Council. So I don't, I'm not sure, but I could say that definitely digitization was uh, a very big priority already in the, in this running program. So I can see that all the experiences you and we, we are having right now due to the crisis, I think that's something which you can use also uh, during the next program and some, something which will definitely um, be valuable for a cooperation project. Okay, maybe, yeah. Yes, there's one more question on um, how important it is for the coordinator to have a rich activity portfolio in the past years and uh, financial situation. So, um, the coordinator um, has to do the whole administration of the product. So it, for the agency and also for the commission, it is important to have, um, yes, to, to have a, um, a organization that can provide um, a good financial capacity and also good operational capacity. So when you do the, uh, when you submit your application, you also have to, um, prove that you can do this project, um, that you can handle the budget. Um, so it is quite important to um, have a rich activity to already um, know how to deal with cooperation projects, perhaps on a um, bilateral level, and um, yes, to prove your your operational and financial uh, capacity. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. I think um, uh, we should now call it call it a day. <laughs> um, I posted in the chat also our contacts because I just realized that we didn't put it on the last slide. <laughs> so if you want to get in touch with Anya or me or one of my colleagues, please visit our website. I posted it in the in the chat or you look for the desk in your country. They are all very nice and very, um, very active colleagues all over Europe um, and send, send them our regards if you talk to them. And um, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, thank you to all of you. Thank you very much to Nemot for giving us the opportunity. And um, yeah, everyone take care, stay safe and um, maybe see you again. <laughs> thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>